parts are as follows. So the Hamiltonian has two terms, the kinetic energy term and the potential. And this potential uh, is zero when the particle is confined between a length zero and A, and it is otherwise infinity. Oh, sorry. Uh, let me start the recording. Okay, someone has stopped. Thank you. Uh, fine. And the energy we found was quantized and a quantum number n was created from one of the boundary conditions. And this tells us the allowed energy levels. Okay. Also, we get uh, wave functions for each value of n. And these are found to be simple sine functions, uh, which then the ground state is even, and then it oscillates even odd, even odd, etc. So, if we want to extend this to a two dimensional box of length A and breadth B, so the particle is now confined in a plane and a rectangle. Then the Hamiltonian now has two kinetic energy terms so one for the motion in the x direction and one for the motion in the y direction. And there is a Potential. Now, what is this potential like? Uh, so, we want infinite uh, barriers on all four sides of this rectangle. So, when x lies between 0 and a and y lies between 0 and b, then the potential is set to 0 and otherwise it is infinity. Okay. Echo uh, hache? Uh, Sangeeta? <laughs> Sangeeta, are you able to hear yeah. Yes. Yeah. I just thought I would clarify, if the box is 0 to 8, then you said that the uh, ground state is even, first excited state is odd. That is uh, strictly not right, because when you say even and odd, you are talking only between 0 and A, with A by 2 as the origin. Yeah. But actually it is not, because the Protons, a wave function is 0 up to minus infinity to 0. So it cannot be, it doesn't have any symmetry. It doesn't have any parity symmetry for that kind of box. And that is the main interesting point that the box is shifted to minus a by 2 to plus a by 2. The potential becomes even. And then only the symmetry will actually come. So in ah. this case, in this case, what you are talking is a symmetry within 0 to a with a by 2 as the origin. Yeah. So the symmetry plane is uh, at a by 2. Yeah, so so that is why it is a little confusing when you said that the potent uh, wave function is even for ground state. If you look at the entire ground state wave function, it is not even because from minus infinity uh, to zero, it is zero. Yeah, okay. Then if you just is, look at the fine form for the full range, then it is uh, it is yeah. It, so, it is an odd function. Yeah. So because when you when you shift the box from minus a by two to plus a by two, okay, uh, yeah. then it will become actually even or odd. And that is one of the interesting problems that if the potential is even function, then the eigenfunctions of that uh, Hamiltonian become either odd or even. That's a parity. Harmonic oscillator also is the same thing. Yeah, that is true. In fact, uh, today I, I was going to show the theorem as well. So, so that is what I said. In that light, uh, this this comment probably might confuse. When you okay. Say that, this, uh, so here, here, okay. So then I should probably just say that the functions when you take the box from zero to a are symmetric and anti-symmetric about the midpoint, maybe. And uh, because even and odd uh, is often uh, interpreted as just changing x to minus x. In that case, uh, this does not hold. Yeah, that is that is true. OK, anyway, OK, yeah. Yeah, so just changing x to minus x will not show you the even and odd properties here. So it's basically symmetric. of uh, So the ground state is symmetric. Then the first excited is anti-symmetric, and so on. Yeah, OK, yeah, it's good to clarify this. That's true. OK. So we can return to the two-dimensional box. And we have this uh, potential, which is uh, 0 inside the rectangle, and it is infinite outside. OK? Uh, then we can write the Schrodinger, time-independent Schrodinger equation with the kinetic energy operator having the x direction kinetic energy and the kinetic energy in the y direction. Okay, then we just rearrange it a little bit. Now, uh, since 
the energy is always positive. Uh, the argument we saw in the one-dimensional case still holds. Then 2me by h cross square is also positive. So I can write this as minus k square, where k is some constant defined by uh, this relation. This relation will also give me the energy uh, expression as before. We can continue now looking for solutions of the form x of x into y of y. So we are again adopting the separation of variables technique. And we are only looking for solutions which are separable into a product of functions. One, uh, one with the variable x and one with the variable y. So I'm using a shorthand notation x, y for this. Just to keep it simple. Then the operation of these second derivatives for, for the which we have to evaluate to find the action of the Hamiltonian. This tells me that del squared del x square of x y, since this is del x square, I can take out y, and I have y x double derivative. And from the second term, I can take out the x, because it does not depend on y, and I have the second derivative of y. Okay, and then we have the right hand side, which was minus k square x y. Uh, so then we can divide throughout by x, y. You can cancel y from the first term, x from the second term, and we get two such terms. Okay, one dependent purely on x, one purely on y. And if I shift the y term to the right, then I get again that my left hand side depends only on x and my right hand side depends only on y. Uh, we used this argument also uh, last class, I think, that if you want a solution to an equation which has two different variables on two different sides only, then the only solution is that both left and right hand side are equal to some constant. So we use that again here. And we say, uh, set that constant to lambda. Okay. So note that here we uh, there is a restriction that k is uh, real because we want k squared to be positive. Uh, here in the first place we don't need lambda to be re uh, real. It can be complex because here we don't know anything about the signs. However, we will find that only the real values uh, are valid. This we will see later. However, okay. So here lambda can be anything. Now, the first equation looks exactly like the particle in a one-dimensional box. So, we can just replicate the same solution. Okay? So, this would be my first guess. But, let's, but there are some tricky things here. We are not sure if this will be the case. Why is that? Firstly, because we have to... Uh, here, we have used a normalization constant, which may be different. And we have also used a boundary condition to evaluate uh, this factor which multiplies with k, uh, with x. And that those boundary conditions are also different here. So we have to verify this. So we, have, we let's step back and read. We can't, we can't hurry here. Okay. Uh, so I rewrite it as x. Uh, second derivative of x is minus lambda squared x. And the uh, general solution to this, again from the classical the harmonic oscillator problem is a sine lambda x plus b cos lambda x. Okay, now when you look at this, let's figure out the boundary conditions. So there are infinite potentials on either side of this rectangle. Okay. So my wave function must decay to zero on all these sides. So, so something you, you just cannot, uh, so the boundary condition is not simply at the corners. So that is the first line that I've written, okay? So it's not just that the wave function is zero at the corners. It is zero along the full four sides. So that means that it for when x is zero, then for all y, the wave function is zero. When the y coordinate is zero, then for all x, the wave function is zero, etc. Okay? So we then have four boundary conditions, basically. And when we expand this psi into x product of x and y, hmm, then we get this relation. Okay. And again, since neither x 
of x nor y of y are zero everywhere. So for all x and y, it cannot be zero because then my wave function itself would disappear. We get the simpler boundary condition that x of zero equal to y of zero equal to x of a equal to y of b equal to zero. So I have four boundary conditions which I can use to evaluate all the uh, constants that arise from solving the differential equation. Okay. Now what about the normalization? So when I normalize a wave function, which I have written as a product of functions here, then I can separate out the two integrals. And so I can choose one into one is equal to one. So we can choose x and y to be individually normalized. Okay. So then now we have verified that I, my normalization of x is fine. Like whatever I did in the one dimensional case will carry through. And also the boundary conditions on X is exactly the same as the one particle, a uh, one dimensional solution. So I can just replicate my solution from the one dimensional case. Okay? And I have then obtained the uh, a condition, a value for lambda as well. And this, as you can see, is always uh, real. So even though I chose lambda to be, it allowed it to be anything, I find that lambda is actually real and also positive. Okay. Now we want to solve for the second part, so the y function. So the y uh, equation was this, and I can rewrite it a little. Just move it around, okay? take the constants to one side and uh, write it again like in the form of a harmonic oscillator equation and a similar solution carries through. Okay. However, we have not uh, obtained the normalization constant for this uh, uh, for the equation in this form. So we don't know A as of now. Okay. So this is, this is the solution for uh, Y. Okay. Now what I want to do now is use the boundary conditions on Y. So Y of B is zero. So I use that and I find And I, I don't find A. What I find is actually a relation between K and lambda. So what have I done here? So I have got A sine root K square minus lambda square B equal to zero. Uh, A is not zero because then the, again the wave function would disappear. Instead, the sine part is zero. So on the right hand side, zero can be written as sine of some integer multiple of pi. And from that, we get a relation between k and lambda. Again, uh, ny equal to 0 is discarded because that would again mean that my wave function disappears, like in the one particle case, uh, one dimensional case, sorry. And if I again, so again, this looks exactly like my one dimensional solution. So my normalization constant will analogously look like root of 2 by b. Because now B is the uh, dimension of the y direction, the box in the y direction. Okay. And then I can reconstruct psi from the product of these two functions and I get something like this. So we have found the two dimensional solution. Uh, the, sorry, the wave function for the two dimensional particle in a box. Now, what about the energy? To find the energy, we need to evaluate the. Uh, the allowed values of k. So what? Uh, so how do we proceed? So we take the relation e is equal to h cross square k square by 2m. And from this relation here, okay, 4, so from this relation here, and, and this expression for lambda, we substitute this here. Okay, and we obtain the value for E. So what have we done here? We substituted the value for lambda and uh, used in this relation and found K and substituted K, K squared here. Okay. And we get an energy expression which looks like, uh, it looks anal analogous to the energy for the one dimensional box. So there it was NX squared by A squared only. Now we've just added a ny squared by b squared. Okay. This is the energy expression. 
So what can we say from this? We can say that the energy levels are controlled by the box length and the quantization of the energies in the various directions are uh, kind of independent of each other. So the Nx depends on A and then Y depends on B in a way. And you have a total energy from this. Uh, as you can see, the since we have been using the one-dimensional box to solve the two-dimensional box, now if you go to three dimensions, it will be very, very similar. So I don't think we need to solve this. Of course, all plotting uh, the solutions for the 2D case or the 3D case is not as easy. Uh, in fact, doing it by hand is some work. Of course, if you have, uh, if you use some software, you can look at the look at the functions like what they look like. And you will see that there are again uh, nodal uh, nodal planes uh, in the two-dimensional case, as opposed to the nodal nodal lines or no, sorry, nodal lines in the two-dimensional case, as opposed to the nodal points in the one-dimensional case. Okay. So this was about the 2D box. You see, it's just a more or less algebra extending from the one-dimensional case. So does anyone have any questions from the particle in a box problem? Have you have you tried going through the derivations yourselves? Okay, fine. So you have not had time, I suppose, to look at it. But uh, whenever you go through it, you can ask me if you have questions. So the second problem we will uh, do today is the particle in a finite square well. Uh, so this actually reveals some uh, interesting phenomena in quantum mechanics. And uh, once we solve it, we will see. So there are lots of new things here again. So what is a finite square well? A finite square well is, uh, again, something like a, part in a, a particle in a one-dimensional box. However, instead of infinite walls, we have a wall, we have walls of finite length or finite height V0. And if, instead of putting the particle at uh, zero and we have made the it made it a well instead of uh, having barriers, unlike in the particle one dimension. So the potential is defined as minus V0 for a certain length, so from minus a to plus a, so a length of 2a, and the uh, and the parts which go to infinity are placed at a potential of 0. Okay, so uh, the idea is that if you have now a particle in this well, then if its energy is uh, more than v0, then it can of course simply escape this well and move either to minus infinity or to plus infinity. However, if the energy is less than V0, then it is trapped in the well. So basically, we should obtain two types of solutions. One is a bound state, so a particle which cannot leave the well. And this we would expect to be similar to what you get for a particle in a 1D box. And those which escape should look something like a free particle, something like it. I'm, I'm not saying it will look exactly like it. Okay. So there should be two kinds of states, and we will see how we can obtain them from the uh, solutions of the Schrodinger equation. Okay. So to solve this, since we have a very distinct uh, potentials on in three segments, we will solve the wave function in three segments. So one is where x is less than minus a then the potential is zero. Uh, and the kind of, and the Schrodinger equation can be written as minus h cross square by 2m del square psi del x square equal to e psi. Now this, uh, so here, because of the def so since we're talking about bound states and for energies which are less than v0, uh, less than v0 or less than vx in this range, you can also write it as vx, then my energy uh, must be negative. If energy is less than Vx, the so energy is less than zero. Because you're talking about the bound states now. So we'll solve the two states separately. 
the bound states separately and the states which uh, which can escape separately. And then since E is negative, then my constant when I take 2m by h cross square to the right is just positive. So recall we had minus k square before, now we have plus k square. And this k square has this uh, expression, so 2me by minus h cross square, which, uh, again, this I've written as kappa, anyway, okay, kappa. So kappa is equal to root of minus 2me by h cross square, e is negative, so uh, kappa is real and kappa is also chosen as positive. Uh, why, why are we allowed to do this and not take two values? Because the general solution to this equation is basically psi x equal to a e to the power minus kappa x plus b e to the power plus kappa x. So if I take kappa to be uh, negative, then we will still have the same solution. Just the first and second term will be interchanged. So we can just, it's sufficient to take it as one, one value. So we just take positive. Okay. Uh, now we look at some boundary conditions again for this psi x. So as x goes to minus infinity, so x is always less than minus a. So, it, so this is for the particle which is uh, on the left of this potential well. So when x goes to minus infinity, e to the power minus kappa x goes to infinity. So my psi becomes infinity if the first term is present. So this is not a valid solution because this is not a normalizable solution. So we simply discard the first term and we keep the second term. Okay? So here if k goes to minus infinity, psi will decay to zero. So this psi is a normalizable function. So this is a physical solution for... Uh, for the left part of the wave function in this finite square well. Then there is case two where we are solving for the wave function in this region, so inside the well. So what happens inside the well? The potential is minus V0. Again, you have the kinetic energy term, the potential term, and the energy term. And you reorganize it to get minus 2me by h cross square e plus V0. <clears throat> Again, this is a bound state, so E is negative. However, if you remember from the last class, uh, we showed that the, uh, that the energy must always be greater than, uh, than the potential in order to have normalizable solutions. Right, so this still holds here. So there, uh, the energy was positive, and the potential was also positive. However, here we have both negative, but this that statement still holds, and we need then that e plus v zero is greater than zero. Here, in that case, this is a negative quantity, so I have to write it as minus l square, where l is a positive real uh, real uh, constant. And this again looks like a harmonic oscillator solution, uh, the classical os uh, oscillator. And then L has this expression and the general solution is easily given as this combination of sine and cos functions. Okay. So now we have something that looks like the particle in a 1D box for the well part of the uh, problem. Then when we go to X, Greater than a, this you can guess it's anal analogous to case one. So, the, but instead of discarding e to the power minus kappa x, here we discard e to the power plus kappa x and only keep the minus kappa x. So that when k tends to plus infinity, my psi tends to zero, allowing it to be normalized. So, how many constants have we introduced here? We have b here, c and d here and f here. We need to find, find out all of these by imposing uh, suitable boundary conditions. Now general boundary conditions for any wave function, uh, there are two of them. One is that psi is always continuous and the second one is that d psi d, the dx is continuous except at points where the potential is infinite. Okay, So the caveat you don't need to look at now because we don't have any infinite potentials in our problem. So we have two boundary conditions that psi is continuous and d psi dx is continuous. Okay? We, we are going to impose these 
And then there is another theorem that Professor Paul just mentioned that if the potential is an even function, that is, if you flip the sign of the uh, coordinate x in the potential function, you get back the original function. So something like maybe vx equal to uh, x squared. There, if x is made minus x, you still get x squared. So that would be an even function of x. So if vx is an even function, then psi x can always be taken to be either even or odd. Okay, so what is the proof of this? The proof is actually very simple. Although the implication uh, of this theorem is very profound, uh, the proof is very, very simple. So it's, it basically relies on the fact that you have a second derivative here. Okay. Uh, and you have a psi in f all the in all the terms. Okay. So if, if I change x to minus x in my general time independent Schrodinger equation, so then what happens is I, I change the sign of, of the same function in all three terms. And the only thing that could have changed my equation is the potential, basically. And here we have taken a situation where v of minus x is v of x. So then that doesn't change. So basically, if you compare these two equations, then if psi x is a solution for the first equation, then psi of minus x is also a solution for the same equation. Okay. And it also has the same energy. Okay. So, so what has happened? So the only thing that was important was that if I change x to minus x in my derivative operator, a second derivative operator, that the sign does not change. And even if my psi of minus x is minus of psi x or something, or some constant in the psi x, that would cancel the equation. Okay. So it is, so it tells us that if you have an even function of potential, then the, uh, even function as a potential, then the uh, solutions to my equation can either be even or they can be odd. And we will use this theorem now to simplify our search of finding all the uh, solutions for psi. Okay. So how does it help us in this particular case? So here uh, it helps us by in, in this case two. So in case two, my psi has two components. One is the sine function and one is the cos function. We know that sine is an odd function and cos is an even function. So if I'm looking for size which are simply odd, then it is sufficient for me to look at C sine LX and discard, uh, discard the even part of psi. And when I'm looking for even solutions, I only keep the cost part and I don't look for the sine part. So that uh, reduces one constant for me. Okay, and it also tells me that the that if I find the solution from the sine part, then the corresponding uh, uh, so the corresponding minus psi x uh, will also be a solution. And from the uh, cos part, we only have one solution because it's an even function. Okay, so then what happens? I simplify my search. My psi x can be written concisely as f e to the power minus kappa x for x greater than a. Okay. And because we're looking for even solutions, we've kept I have kept only the cos part here. Okay. Both for uh, 0 to a, so the positive half of the well, and from minus a to uh, 0, so that is the uh, left part of the well, left half of the well, okay? And for the left half of the well, we can write it as minus L of X. Now, of course, it is still the same function because it is an even function, but we can write it like this. And when you're looking for the region which is beyond minus A, then, <clears throat> then we again have the plus kappa X, 
note that we have set the constant b equal to f here because we want to ensure that if psi x is a solution then so is psi of minus x. so it also helps me for the two uh, for the left and right side of the well so outside the well the solutions uh, are also simplified and we now get two constants that we need to evaluate and also ln kappa if you want to include them so, so total of four four um, four constants which need to be evaluated so now we uh, use the boundary general boundary conditions so since psi must be continuous continuous at x equal to a uh, so then these two wave functions must be equal at x equal to a okay. so we use that here we have substituted a for x and we also know that the derivative should be continuous at x equal to a so i have taken a derivative of this at x equal to a and a derivative of this at x equal to a and equated them and that gives me a relation here in terms of a tan function okay and this equation should in principle tell me what energies are allowed for the bound particle here uh but this is not an easy equation to solve so we have to do some tricks here so what we do is that i start with la equal so i i do some um, change of variables to make it look nice okay so but my goal is simply to solve this equation and find out uh, allowed values of l and and kappa so la equal to z is one uh, substitution that i use and the second one we need to take a hint from somewhere so we look at kappa equal to root of minus 2 me by h cross this was my definition and this and the definition for l was root of 2 m e plus v0 by h cross okay so there is an e here and e plus v0 here and k by l uh, kappa by l sorry is root of minus e by e plus v0 but is this helpful uh let's see so just substituting this here does not help me find l because of the uh, e in terms of l that that is a bit complicated okay and i don't need e in terms of l what i need is basically to find out allowed values of them so to do that i square k and l and add them so you see, you can see that that one term will get cancelled here so that that sort of indicates what i should do so i do kappa square plus l square and i cancel out the 2me by h cross square term and i'm left with only the v0 term okay so that is helpful Why? Because v zero is a known quantity, and I wanted a relation between uh, kappa and l, and also the allowed values of l at after some time. We want so that. That is the goal. Okay? So that's that, and then I set this to be equal to z zero square by a square. Uh, now, why why are we introducing this a? Uh, because you see, we have defined l a as z. So So we are trying to keep uh, the same units in a way for z and z zero because that will make things look nice. That's all. It doesn't really matter as long as you can solve it. It does not matter. Okay. But this is the uh, neatest way of doing it. So that that's how we are going about it. So we do z zero by a square on the right hand side for this. and then we get again l a square if i multiply a square to the left then i get a square a square l a square equal to z zero square l a is z so i write that and i get uh, k a or kappa a as root of z zero square minus z square okay then we go back to our tan expression and there you have la which i write as z and that is equal to kappa by l 
I can multiply A to both. So I have kappa A by LA. And kappa A is Z0 square minus Z square root of that. And LA is Z. And we get a relatively neat expression where we want to find out Z. But again, this is also still not easy to solve. So how can we do it? We can either solve it numerically or we can solve it graphically where you plot the two functions uh, tan z and uh, z0 square by z square minus 1 square root and you find out the values for the points of intersection. Okay, And then you get the allowed values of z and since z is equal to la you get the allowed values of l. Once you get the allowed values of l then from the expression that h cross square l square equal to 2m e plus v0, you can get the allowed values of e. Okay. So for the finite square well, uh, I will actually stop here at this energy. Uh, and I will only indicate that the for the odd solutions, as you can imagine, you simply have the same for the two uh, for the left, so outside the well, you still have the same solutions, and inside the well, you choose the odd solution. So it's the sine function. Okay. The sine part of the bound state solution. Okay. So it, is, is this clear to people that why, why we're solving separately and uh, why we're discarding the cos in one case and the sine in one case? And so far, we have only spoken about the bound state solutions. Okay? So in, throughout the section, E is always negative. That, that is already an assumption. So we are only finding solutions where E is negative. Okay? So does anyone have any questions till this point? No. Okay. So actually, I didn't want to do a very long class today because there are lots of uh, little things here. So if any of you have any questions from anywhere you can ask me since we have quite some time still. Quite a lot of time. No? Ma'am, uh, could you repeat the reason why we take uh, sine and cos separately? Uh, yeah. The solutions odd and even. Yeah, so the thing, uh, so there is a theorem that we just proved that if you have a potential function which is even, let me, let me go there. Yeah. So there is this theorem that if Vx is an even function, then psi x can always be taken to be either even or odd. So my solutions are clearly classified into either even or odd. So when I get the general uh, solution here to be C sine of Lx plus D of cos Lx, uh, this general function uh, cannot have a property of being either purely odd or purely even. Because the sine part is a uh, odd part, is odd and the cost part is even. So for the odd solutions, you can only have the sine part. And for the even solutions, you can only have the cost part. So that is, uh, that is not really a boundary condition, but it is something we know. No, no about the cases when the function is neither even nor odd. Or do we write it in a way that it is a sum of even and odd functions? 
and then solve it separately uh, so if my uh, so if my potential is not even for example then i don't know no, don't know this about the solutions and then the solutions can be a combination of even and odd so and then you would have to find out a way of determining c and d so, so here what we do solving it separately right yeah then you need uh, need to use more boundary conditions and find out both we just simplified it. even if we kept it general uh, in principle we have enough boundary conditions to find c and d and you would of course in this particular case since b is even you would find that d is zero in one case and c is zero in the other case so you will so they would automatically separate out if you evaluate uh, find out c and d separately but we are sort of simplifying our problem by using this extra information that we have but if if my potential was not even for example then you would have to go through the uh, full procedure of finding c and d okay So something uh, I wanted to talk about maybe next class was the structure of the 2D solution. Uh, so the solution that we obtained from the particular 2D box, if you all please, uh, will please go through it till uh, by, by Tuesday. I guess you will because there will be the quiz on Tuesday. Then... Uh, I will talk a little bit about what you can find out from the particle in a 2D box, a solution. Because you see, we just stopped at the solution mathematically. We didn't do any sort of interpretation from it. And uh, I will also talk about the states which are not bound for the finite square. So these are called scattering states. Okay, and. Uh, here it's just like a free particle which experiences a potential does something in the well and leaves so that requires a little bit of different thinking so i will just uh, describe it a little bit so that is for tuesday and then we will have the quiz for about half an hour so in half an hour we will talk a little bit about the interpretation of the 2d problem and the scattering states in the finite square well and then we will have a half an hour. Okay, and till here is your uh, syllabus for the quiz. So three classes. Okay. So if there are no more questions, I will just stop presenting here and also stop recording.